and welcome to this video on Alkenes. Um, my name is Chris Harris and I'm from AnnaryTutors.com and this video is specifically for OCRA. Um, the whole point of this video is basically to just give you an overview of the Alkenes topic for OCRA. Um, these slides that I'm using here, they can be purchased. If you just click on the link below in the description box and you can get hold of them there. It's great for revision. You can use them on your phone, your tablet or whatever. Um, you can supplement your revision notes with them as well. Like I say, these are specifically linked to OCRA and they match these specification points that are listed on here. Okay, so let's have a look at alkenes and what they are. So these are unsaturated hydrocarbons, okay? So they have the general formula CNH2N. Now, this general formula only applies um, if you have one double bond in the molecule, okay? So they are hydrocarbons. Um, they contain hydrogen and carbon only. They're unsaturated. It means they have at least one double covalent bond, uh, and they can undergo addition reactions, which I'll look at later on. Um, so here's some examples. Ethene is CH2CH2, and this one is buto-1,3-diene, which is CH2CHCHCH2. So you see, we've got two alkenes here. Okay, the double bonds they have a really high electron density. Uh, this makes them fairly reactive, actually, a lot more reactive than alkenes, which don't have this double bond. And you can have cycloalkenes as well. These have two fewer hydrogens than their straight chain counterparts. So you can see here that we've obviously got a double bond here, um, and this has obviously reduced the number of hydrogens compared to this. So this is cyclopentene as an example, C5H8. Okay, so we need to know a little bit more about these bonds and what they are, and we're going to look at things called sigma and pi bonds. So a double bond contains a sigma and a pi bond, so it contains both. Okay, so sigma bonds are basically just two s orbitals. When they overlap, they align horizontally. And what they do is they give the single covalent bond. Okay, there's a strong electrostatic attraction between the nuclei and the shared pair of electrons, um, and this is because we've got this high electron density between the nuclei here. Okay, so you can see here we've got this overlap of the s orbitals, uh, and this is a sigma bond. So like sigma s. Okay, high bond enthalpy, really, really strong. This sigma bonds are really strong. They're the strongest type of covalent bond. So um, because of this overlap of electrons and strong attraction between the nucleus and the shared electrons. Pi bonds, on the other hand, are slightly different. So these are where you've got a parallel overlap of two p orbitals. Remember the p orbitals are shaped in like a figure of eight, a bit like this. So what these do is they merge and they form this dumbbell shape. Okay, so they form two oblong shapes. It looks a, bit, a little bit like a bun. Um, and basically a hot dog bun and one on the top and you've got one on the bottom okay and the pi bonds are weaker than sigma bonds okay so when we're breaking these it's easier to break a, a, a pi bond than it is a sigma and you'll see these reactions later on and see actually they are relatively easy the electron density spread over a um, a larger area spread over the top and the bottom and so the electrostatic attraction in pi bonds um, actually have a lower bond enthalpy because the electron density has been spread over a larger area. So you can see this kind of diagram representation there. Okay, so the reactivity of these things, like I say, so the double bond has a really high electron density. Okay, so they have this sigma and pi, as we've seen before, loads of electrons in that area and it makes them reactive. So four electrons are being shared in the double bond, which are the S from the sigma and pi uh, orbitals. Okay, the pi bonds, should we say. So alkenes only have sigma bonds. They don't have pi bonds because they've only got these single bonds. So um, they are non-polar, uh, and so they are not very reactive compared to alkenes. Okay, so they don't have any polarity that is bog-standard boron. Uh, one of the ways in which you can react them is really through radicals, which are so reactive, and they actually break up the alkane. Um, but these alkenes are much more reactive because of that double bond. Okay, now the pi bond in the double bond sticks out a little bit uh, and the whole double bond has a high electron density. You've got loads of electrons in there. This means it's really open to attack from electrophiles and electrophiles are electron loving species and an alkene has loads of electrons because it's got that double bond. It looks a little bit like a hot dog bun. Like I say, if you look at it, if maybe if you tilt your head and squint, you can probably just about see it. But um, yeah, okay. So as long as you can remember the shape of this thing, that's all. Okay, so the pi bond has a low bond enthalpy. Remember, because it's really easy to break this thing. Um, this is why alkenes are so reactive. It doesn't take much energy to break this uh, pi bond. 
Okay, so alkenes are really good for polymers, as you'll see later on. We'll look at polymers uh, and petrochemicals as well, um, which is obviously uh, made from crude oil. Uh, double bonds have something called stereoisomers, uh, also known as EZ isomerism. Okay, and these basically have the same structural formula, but different arrangement of atoms in space. So, for example, um, one of them is EZ isomerism. So the CC bond, double bond, uh, in the atoms are directly the the C bonds are the, the sorry the hydrogens that are bonded or their molecules or atoms bonded directly to the CC double bond carbons um, are actually planar they're flat okay so the shape of the CCH2 is trigonal planar it has an angle of 120 and you can see as you've drawn this diagram here to show what we mean so the bond angle is 120 and it's flat it's planar. The atoms can't rotate around this double bond, it's rigid, so it can't move. And this means we can get this stereoisomerism, we get this EZ isomerism, which is also known as. Okay, so here's an example. So these are two stereoisomers of each other. Okay, so they have the same structural formula, but the bond can't twist. This bit here can't twist. So basically this arrangement is now fixed, whereas this one is fixed as well. But you can notice, see the difference? Instead of this group here, the ethyl group being on the top, the ethyl group is now on the bottom. And these are different isomers of each other. They're called stereoisomers. Okay, so these have, like we say, they have restricted rotation around the double bonds. Okay, and we get EZ isomerism where we have two different atoms or groups of atoms on the same carbon. Here we've got two atoms, here we've got two different ones as well. So they're different. Okay. So we can name these molecules as E or Z. E meaning entgegen, which is German for opposite. Uh, same groups on the opposite side of the double bond. And Z is Sutzamen, which means together in German. So if you do German, you'll probably know this. Um, some groups of the uh, same groups on the same side of the double bond. So let's have a look at these examples. This one's a Z pentuene because it's the same group. Look, your two hydrogens are on the same side. Okay, so you're looking for the same groups. This one's E pentuene because the two hydrogens here, these are the same groups, are on the opposite side of the double bond. So we call this E pentuene. Uh, they can also be called cis, which means same side or trans opposite side. So you might see it also named as that. Okay, it gets a bit strange when we have to use these rules. We call them the Kahn Ingold Prelog rules. These are named after the three people who basically came up with these rules. We call them Kip rules. Um, and these basically decide if an isomer is E or Z when we have four different groups around the double bond. So in all them examples we've shown you before, we had two hydrogens, so they were two groups which are the same. But what happens if you didn't have them as the same? So the first thing you need to do is label your carbons with double bond, uh, with a double bond, attach the double bond as carbon one and carbon two. You need to see we've done that there. The second thing is we need to calculate the atomic number, not the mass number. Okay, this is the number of protons, the atomic number for the first element directly bonded to the CC. Okay, so the atom with the highest atomic number is given a higher priority. So let's have a look on this side. The atomic number of bromine is 35. Use your periodic table for this. And the atomic number of carbon, because we're looking at the first atom, is 6. So this is given the higher priority. And on this side, the higher priority is given to carbon because carbon has obviously a proton number of six. This has a proton number of one. So that's given the higher priority. Then all we have to do is we're looking for the two high priority groups. See where they are on carbon one and carbon two. And you can see these are opposite sides of the double bond. So we've got a high priority there and a high priority there. So this is going to be E2 bromopent 2 e Okay, because they're opposite sides. Okay, so just look for your high priorities. So you may have to check further down the chain as well to work out some of these priorities. So here on carbon two, there are two carbons immediately bonded to carbon two. And both of these have an atomic number of six. You can see here there, carbon and carbon. So what we need to do is we need to look at the next atom down the chain as there's another carbon on the ethyl group. And you can see here, there's another carbon there, okay? Uh, this has an atomic number of six. But on this one, the next carbon, the next atom along here is just hydrogen. That only has an atomic number of one. So this now takes priority over this because the second carbon is obviously heavier. So obviously on this side though, the higher priority is bromine, obviously because it's a much bigger, uh, much bigger atom than hydrogen, which is one. And like we say, this one has the higher priority because we've got six, then six, 
This one is six, then one. So that takes the lower priority. So that one is a higher priority. So the ethyl group takes the higher priority. The two higher priority groups, again, are opposite the double bond. So the name of this is E1-bromo-2-methyl-butuanine. So the E meaning that we've got it opposite the double bond. Okay, so just look down your chain to work them out further. Okay, electrophilic addition. So this is where we're going to look at our mechanisms. So alkenes are attacked by electrophiles due to their double bonds. Okay, the double bond has a really high density of electrons and is attacked by electrophiles. The electrophile adds to the molecule. Okay, so an electrophile is an electron pair acceptor. So they are deficient in electrons and are attracted to the double bond, as you'll see in a minute. So electrophile examples, we've got NO2+, plus, H+, plus. these are all electrophiles, they have a positive charge, um, and so they're deficient in electrons. Electrophile, more examples, there might be polar, they might not have a full positive charge, so like HBr, H2SO4, these are examples of electrophiles as well, because they might have that delta positive part. So all electrophilic addition reactions, the curly owl starts at the double bond because that's where all the electrons are. And it moves over towards the electrophile. In this case, I've just represented it as E+. Plus. That's your electrophile. And so basically, this is accepting the electrons from the double bond. Um, we can also add hydrogen as well. Um, these are quite common. Um, you might start with an alkene, and you're going to form an alkene. All we do is we add a um, hydrogen gas react it with it with ethene at 150 degrees celsius with a nickel catalyst and we make ethane which is this here so ethene plus hydrogen forms ethane okay so the addition of bromine um these are a test for alkenes so we're going to use that mechanism we've just looked at before so a test for alkenes is the decoloration of bromine water Okay, so adding bromine water to an alkene causes a color change from brownie orange to colorless. So bromine is the brownie orange um, solution that we're going to be using, or the liquid, um, and is this is the electrophile. Okay, it adds to the alkene, forming dibromoalkane, which is colorless. So here it is. Here, there's your double bond. Um, we've got all the electrons in here. The bromine is polarized because as this bromine molecule normally it isn't polarized; it's just a standard bog standard bromine molecule but when it approaches close to this area of high electron density the electrons move to one side of the molecules because they are repelling each other so what we get is this temporary dipole here so we've got a delta negative on this bromine delta positive on this bromine okay and the electron pair in the double bond this is attracted to the delta positive bromine uh, and this effectively makes uh, push the electrons onto that bromine and then that has to break this bond. The electrons from this bond move into there. So let's have a look. There it is. There's your first one, and there's the second one. Okay. So, but this is effectively starting to bond with it. Now, what we get is a carbocation intermediate. You can see here that we've got a bromine attached to it. We've got this uh, positive carbon here. Lone pair of electrons from this bromine. This is going to go in and attack this. So we've got lone pair of electrons moving in for that delta positive, uh, that proper positive carbon. Okay, uh, and we form this product. This is colorless. One, two, dibromoethane is formed. Obviously, this is a colorless solution. Okay, hydration of alkenes. So alcohols, they can be produced by the hydration of alkenes. Um, so what we do is we use steam. And we use an acid catalyst, H+. We're going to represent the acid catalyst as. And we're going to create that alcohol. Now, when we um, use steam and ethene, um, the catalyst we're going to use is phosphoric acid and the temperature we're looking at is 300 degrees celsius for this reaction to go and 60 atmospheres of pressure is needed okay so let's have a look at the reaction here it is here so we've got ethene which is this molecule here that's reacting with water which is steam in the form of steam this is in equilibrium and this is going to form your ethanol okay which is your alcohol and um, this reaction is reversible um so this actually only yields about 5%, which is pretty rubbish, to be honest, initially. However, any unreacted alkene, which is this here, is recycled through an overall yield of 90 to 95% can be attained, So, um, which is pretty useful. So we're looking for really high yields because alcohol is pretty cheap, to be honest, and we need to try and maximize the yield that we can make to for companies to make more money from it. 
Okay, we can also add other molecules. So we looked at the addition of bromine, which is Br2. We can also add hydrogen halides. So alkenes, these react with hydrogen halides to form halogenoalkenes. So for example, HBr follows the same mechanism uh, as an addition of a halogen. So the mechanism can apply to other hydrogen halides and alkenes too. So they might get you to do HCl or HI. Okay, so here it is here. HBr is permanently polarized. So there's no uh, induced dipole here. There's your alkene. And it's the same mechanism. Okay, so the electron pair in the double bond is attracted to the delta positive hydrogen. There it is. Okay, this is starting to form a bond, but obviously the bond between the H and the Br has to break. There it is. Okay, and we form our Br minus. Now, what we get is our carbocation intermediate, just like before. So the hydrogen is added first, and then the bromine is then added later. So we've got this electrons from the lone pair and the bromine onto the carbocation. There it is there. Uh, and obviously then we form our bromoethane is formed. Uh, there's the formation of bromoethane. So you can see the mechanism is actually the same as the addition of Br2. So not too bad. Okay, if we're reacting them though with unsymmetrical alkenes, we actually produce two different products and you've got to be aware of this as well. So the amount of the two products is determined by the stability of the carbocation intermediate, so it's how stable it is. So the more alkyl groups bonded to that carbocation, the more stable the intermediate is, okay? So this is because alkyl groups, what they do is they push electrons into the positive carbocation, and this stabilizes the carbocation. And if the carbocation is more stable, it's more likely to form. So mechanisms going via stable carbocations will probably produce, you'll get more of the products produced via them ones. So let's have a look. This is a primary carbocation. Now the R represents the alkyl group and the red arrow symbolizes where the electrons are being donated to. Okay, so this is a primary carbocation, one alkyl group bonded to a carbon, the rest are hydrogens. Secondaries though, and tertiaries, have just got more alkyl groups attached to it. So this has got two alkyl groups, all pushing electrons in, trying to stabilize that carbocation. And if you've got three of them, well, this makes the carbocation even more stable. So tertiary carbocations are more stable than secondaries. So you've really got to know what type of carbocation intermediate form, because that will give you an indication as to how much product you produce. So if we're reacting hydrogen halides with an unsymmetrical alkene, we get these two different products. So let's have a look at this one. This is propionine. Now you see it's unsymmetrical. Again, normal mechanism, okay, so we've got the going from the double bond to the hydrogen that breaks the uh, to form the bromine, and we form this primary carbocation here, okay. Now, primary carbocations, remember, they're not very stable, so we form, um, obviously, the, the hydrogen is being added onto this carbon here, uh, and obviously leaving the primary carbocation. However, we can add the hydrogen onto this here and leave a secondary carbocation. So let's have a look. There it is there. Okay, this is a secondary carbocation, two methyl groups either side of this carbon. This is more stable and formed more often. So let's finish off the mechanisms. There we go. So that forms one bromopropane. That's a minor product because the intermediate formed is less stable. And this one forms two bromopropane, which is a major product because we form more of it. The intermediate is more stable. It's a secondary carbocation. So it's all about this intermediate. It's really important. Okay, you might have heard of this as well. It's called Makovnikov's rule. Um, basically, he said the major product uh, when we add a, a hydrogen halide to an unsymmetrical alkene is where the hydrogen adds to the carbon with the most number of hydrogens um, already attached. Okay, so basically, if we look here, the hydrogen, um, this is the carbon with the most number of hydrogens attached already. So if the hydrogen adds here instead of this carbon, which only got one, then you're always going to form a more stable product. So there's the more stable product. That's your secondary one. So it's basically just his rule describing what we've what we've done here. Okay, so let's look at some addition polymers. Remember we said we can use alkenes to make polymers. Okay, so alkenes are actually the monomers. Okay, these are the building blocks that make up polymers. And these will join together to form addition polymers. So polymers come in two different types. You have natural and synthetic. So natural ones are things like proteins and natural rubber. And your synthetic ones are things like polyethene. That should be an ene. Bit of a typo there. And polypropene. Okay. So 
polymers, they've been used for quite a while. Charles Goodyear came up with the first one in 1844, and he came up with vulcanized rubber. Basically, he accidentally actually added um, a chemical to natural rubber, and it made the new vulcanized rubber harder wearing, really good for tyres. Um, and so Goodyear tyres, obviously, they're still around. Certainly was a good year for him um, after discovering that because, obviously, his company is, is now worth a fortune. Obviously, he's not alive now. Um, but the company's still going, so what a legacy to leave. Um, also, in the last 100 years, these polymers have been developed. So we've got things like polyethene again. That should be an E. This is a typical PowerPoint, changing my um, enes to enes. Okay, this would be polyethene, nylon and teflon. And these polymers have revolutionized our standard of living. So obviously we make water bottles, make smartphones and um, plastic components for cars. Uh, you know, loads of things. A calculator, I mean, plastics really have revolutionized what we've done. So new polymers are being synthesized obviously all the time. We're getting even smart polymers now. Um, we can get biometrics and everything. We're getting really high tech now. Uh, and obviously this brings new uses and properties. Okay, so to make polypropene, um, it's actually kept the E in this time. It's kept the E in the other side, right? So to make polypropene, we need um, the monomer propene um, and add a few of these together and we're going to make our polypropene. So let's have a look. Here's our monomer propene. Okay, so um, the double bond basically opens up to form the polymer. Okay, so here it is here. Now we've got a few features of this that we need to be aware of. You can see all I've done is just open that double bond up. Okay, so the N unit at the bottom here represents how many repeat units we have. Okay, so it means we just have loads and loads and loads of these repeating. That's what a polymer is. Uh, this is an example of one repeat unit, um, but the um, double bond is obviously not there anymore. It's been opened up and it's formed. These, which are training bonds, and these extend beyond the brackets. You've got to put this thing in a bracket to show your repeat units. Okay, this is one repeat unit that's been displayed here. Uh, this one is a repeat unit of two monomers, so this is a double repeat unit, um, and so they might get you to do that as well. Notice the N is missing because we're not looking at um, just a polymer. We've been specifically showing a repeat unit of two monomers. Okay, so polyalkenes are saturated molecules. Um, so normally non-polar and hence they're unreactive. So they don't degrade well in landfill. Um, so really we're trying to look at uh, plastics which are more biodegradable or if we can recycle them, that's even better. Um, so obviously technology is improving all the time to um, try and reduce the waste of plastic. Okay, so let's have a look at the uh, disposal of these things. Obviously, we make them and they're everywhere, so it's really important to know um, how we get rid of them. And there's a few ways in which you can do it, and this one's landfill. But most polymers are not biodegradable, okay? That's the problem. So we need to dispose of them uh, properly. So landfill is useful for disposing of plastics that are actually too difficult to recycle. Sometimes we can't recycle them. Um, we are um, sometimes they're too difficult to separate from other materials because they might be integrated within metals or within other components so it's really difficult to do that or there's not enough plastic to extract it to make it economically viable so it's just easier just throwing it onto landfill because it's cheaper um, it's not very sustainable though landfill um, large amounts of land is needed it's becoming more expensive um, uh, the government in the UK in particular they tax they have a land tax um, which taxes um, waste companies for um, putting um, waste into landfills. So it is becoming increasingly more expensive to just put things in landfills. So it forces people to do other things with it. Uh, and there's a need to reduce our reliance on landfill. Um, and basically they're incentivizing recycling schemes. Uh, and this leads us nicely onto recycling. So most plastics, um, they are made from crude oil, um, which is a non-renewable source. Again, it's not very sustainable um, in terms of making it from there because it will run out eventually. So by recycling, it means actually that we're reducing our reliance on crude oil and using crude oil all the time to make plastics. Recycling helps to make use of plastics time and time again to make sure we can make use out of them. So some plastics like polypropene, these can be remolded. We can make new objects, which is pretty useful. Not all plastics can do that though, but other plastics can be cracked. So basically that just means we take the polymer chain and we break it up into um, smaller monomers. And these then can be used to make new plastics, completely new plastics. So you can see the technology is really starting to develop uh, and we're starting to use these plastics much more efficiently 
uh, and making sure that we're not wasting um, natural resources and basically keeping it for future generations to use. Um, another way of disposing plastics is incineration. So this is burning them. So basically we can use them and we can, um, this would be useful for plastics that can't be recycled. And we can use the energy that we get from burning the plastics to make electricity, So, um, which could be quite useful. So it's another uh, novel idea of using it. However, there's always a downside. So plastics, when you burn them, they release these toxic fumes. Okay, And you've got to monitor these things. You've got to trap them and process them and do things with them. So mainly the harmful ones are PVC. Burning PVC releases HCl, which is obviously acidic, uh, and it's not very good when you're breathing that stuff in. So you've got to be really careful with this stuff. And what we can do is we can put in these flue gas scrubbers, and basically these neutralize the acidic gases, things like HCl that's produced when we burn PVC. Uh, and what they do is they just fire a base, like a solution of a base, at the flue gases, this reacts with the acidic gases and forms a neutral salt. So it's preventing it from going into the atmosphere. There is a wave of these biodegradable polymers, and you see these carrier bags, some supermarkets have brought these carrier bags out that actually can biodegrade, So, which you put them into the ground and they decompose naturally, which is actually pretty useful. Um, so you can see, again, technology is really advancing. Biodegradable polymers, they decompose under certain conditions by organisms. So these biodegradable polymers are made from both oil fractions and renewable sources, such as starch. We can get that from potato. Um, and they are more expensive, though, because obviously the resources that we're using um, require a little bit more energy. We need to manufacture them a different way. And we're using land to grow the um, products to make the starch in the first place. So that could be quite expensive. So they are more expensive, but more and uh, more environmentally friendly. So for biodegradable plastics to degrade, you need a good supply of oxygen and moisture. A bit like this compost bin that's sitting over here. So we can use biodegradable plastics in frost protective sheets and plants. So this is pretty useful because um, they're made from polyethene. Okay, again, my... My uh, PowerPoint is again changing my letters over. This is polyethene. They're all with alkenes, by the way, in the brackets. So polyethene and starch grains. Okay, so over time, microorganisms break down the polymer, meaning that you don't need to dispose of the old sheeting. So that's pretty useful. So obviously, we, we put it over our plants and leave it over the winter. And then basically, by the time the spring comes, the polymer sheet is disintegrated uh, into the soil. Um, and you don't need to take it off. So for a farmer, that's great because it saves you time. It's more um, more cost effective. We can get these ones as well, photodegradable polymers. These degrade when exposed to sunlight. These could be used useful on things um, uh, on things like um, sticking signs onto walls, uh, plasters, for example. Um, if you're a bit like me and I've got some hairy arms, um, when you put a plaster over hairs and you pull the plaster off, you'll probably know it. it actually, pretty hurts. Uh, if you rip it off quickly, obviously you pull it off slowly, don't you? But um, uh, yeah, but what you could do maybe is just take the top layer off, expose that to sunlight, break down the adhesive, and then the plaster will drop off really easily. That would actually probably be more, more useful if you had a wound underneath that was really raw and sore, um, you know, and you didn't really want to tug at it too much. So um, that could be um, a potentially a good use of a photodegradable polymer. And so that's it. Um, that's basically an overview of alkenes. Um, it's quite a nice topic when you think. Um, obviously, all the biodegradable stuff and new technology. It's quite interesting. So, um, okay. So, please subscribe to my channel. It's really good to um, to receive your support. Um, and you get all the updates on the um, uh, on the new videos that we upload. So, if you just click on the middle button now, uh, you'll be able to subscribe. That'd be great. Also, if you'd like to copy these PowerPoints, as always, you can uh, click on the link in the description box and you can purchase them from there. But that's it now. Bye-bye.